Awesome. Thanks so much, Faraz. And can you see that okay? That looks okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm just setting um, my little tab with all of your faces and names and everything off to my other screen so that it's not in my way over here. So if you see me glancing over there, that's what I'm doing is checking out what, what y'all are doing over here. So, yeah, uh, and if you have any, what's that, Faraz? I just said fabulous. Okay. You go ahead. And if you have any questions, um, I'm not going to have the chat open during the presentation, but feel free to put them in the chat as we go along, or you can wait until the end. Either one is fine. And then I'll be able to get to the questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, so thanks so much, everyone, for being here. I am really looking forward to spending uh, some time with you today. And I see that people are coming in from all over the world, which is really incredible. So whatever time zone you're in, whatever time it is, I really appreciate you being here. And uh, I hope that you enjoy yourself. So today we're going to be talking about how to use uh, size and shape of birds to narrow down the kind of bird that you're looking at when you're in the field and to help as an identification tool. And I just invite you to, since we're gonna be getting into a lot of different material over the next hour or so, to get comfortable, uh, grab your favorite beverage, whatever that might be. Um, and if you want to take notes, feel free to do that as well but we will be sending out an email after the presentation just with an outline of everything that we're gonna be covering so that I can also uh, just make sure I have outlined some of the key tips and strategies that I'm gonna be giving you at the end of the presentation and sort of throughout the presentation as well. So if you don't wanna take notes, but you still wanna make sure you're able to kind of come back and reference, that's fine. I'll send you a message after this and, and make sure I get that over to you. So if we haven't yet met before today, my name is Krista Rolls. I'm an avian ecologist and conservation biologist, as Faraz mentioned, and I've been working uh, with birds and conserving them in their habitats for about the last nine years or so. Currently, I'm working with great-tailed grackles, which is the bird you see me holding there uh, on the left side of the screen. And uh, I've just been having a lot of fun doing that over this past year and into this next year, I'll be also working with great-tailed grackles. And this past September, I founded Birding Tools and the Birding Tools podcast, where I uh, have just created sort of a space for beginner birders and those enthusiastic about birding to learn more about birding and, and identifying birds in sort of an unintimidating way. Uh, and just a few other things about me. I love coffee. I love to travel to new places. And when I'm not birding, I am typically out backpacking or in, in nature in some shape or form. And I just want you to know too, so you know, all of the content that we're gonna be talking about today, there's gonna be a lot of stuff that we're covering, but no matter where you are in your birding journey, you're in the right place. If you have any questions or something that I mentioned, um, you know, doesn't make any sense, or you have questions about some of the terms I'm using, uh, feel free to ask me, um, or I'll be also giving my contact information at the end of the presentation. You can always reach out to me and we can have a further discussion if you have any additional questions about something that we're talking about today. So why do we wanna talk about size and shape? Why is that important? Um, and how can that help inform us about what kind of bird we might be seeing in the field? Um, and, you know, actually I wanna preface this too, we are all over the world. And one thing that's really cool about size and shape, as well as some of these other keys to bird identification is that you can use these keys no matter where you are in the world. All of these different uh, facets that in, in parts of sort of the bird identification equation can be coupled together to reach a species level identification no matter where you are. Uh, so uh, my hope is that as we're going through the different concepts for one of these keys of bird identification today, it'll help kind of put some of those puzzle pieces into place uh, for your bird identification journey as well. So the five keys to bird identification are those that we can use together to determine a bird's identification. 
So the first of those is size and shape, which we'll be talking about today. And that includes the overall body size and shape of the bird, as well as the uh, size and shape of the individual parts of the bird. The colors and patterns found on the bird and how they're distributed on the bird. A bird's behavior or sort of the overall impression of the bird as far as their posture or flight or foraging and other movement uh, behaviors go. Their habitat and distribution, so where they're found locally in what kind of habitat as well as the regional distribution and, and where they're found in those regions seasonally. And sound or the kinds of sounds that birds make. And so for today's purposes, we're just going to be focusing on that top uh, one, size and shape, and the overall body shape and size, as well as the size and shape of the individual parts of the bird. So what we're going to do first is just kind of overall go over what it means to have different bird sizes. So birds can range anywhere from something smaller than a sparrow, like a hummingbird, all the way up to goose-sized or larger, which is maybe something like an ostrich, super large birds. But the idea here to keep in mind and why size matters in this way is that birds that are similarly related to each other are going to be sized relatively similarly. So all sparrows are going to be around the same size as each other. All geese are going to be around the same size as each other. You're not going to find a goose, unless it's a very new baby goose, uh, the same size as a sparrow, uh, and vice versa. You're never going to set, find a sparrow that's the same size as a goose. So when we're thinking about size and we're getting first initial impressions as we are looking at a bird out in the field, getting a gauge on sort of the overall size of that bird can automatically help us narrow down and eliminate potential birds that we might be thinking of in our minds as we're working on an identification for a bird. So keep that in mind that these size components can really come into play. Uh, when we're just trying to figure out, okay, what category of birds might I even be thinking about as I'm thinking about trying to identify this bird? And when we start putting the size and shape of individual parts of the bird and the shape of the bird overall, we can really start noticing those differences a little bit more. So, and by the way, I'm just using silhouettes here to start because I think it's a really good way, you know, a lot of times when we're looking at bird identification, we can get really hung up in uh, the different colors of the birds and color as one of the keys to bird ID is very important. But, uh, you know, when we're looking at the size and shape, it allows us to just focus on uh, that size and shape component about what, what group that bird might be in and, and sort of what the uh, overall impression of the bird is without sort of getting in the weeds too much about what colors is it and you know where is it located and all this other kind of stuff. So first, we're just gonna focus on that using these silhouetted birds. So for the goose, you can see that it has this thick sloping bill, a long neck with fairly long legs relative to its body size, webbed feet, and a body that's fairly large relative to its head. Now that's drastically different from the parts that we see on the thrush just next to it. Uh, and thrushes include things like you know, American robins or the, um, I think for as you said, the spectacled uh, thrush earlier, you're just mentioning it. Um, so all thrushes are going to have around the same shape. All geese are going to have around the same shape with those individual uh, parts and the, the shape of those birds. And that thrush has a short pointed bill. It has toes that are distinctly different from the geese in the way that uh, they uh, are positioned and how they can perch. Uh, and it has, a, it has a neck, but it's not as distinct necessarily as the goose. And those two birds are also very different from the owl and the hummingbird that we see there. The owl has a very large head relative to its body size. It barely has a neck that's visible, has a very small bill, has large talon feet. And compared to the hummingbird, uh, the hummingbird you know, has a very small body, very teeny tiny toes, and a long, thin needle-like bill. So when we're looking at these different categories or groups of different birds, it can be really helpful to notice those different facets, not only the overall size of the body, but how the body is shaped, how it's positioned uh, on itself, where is its head relative to the rest of its body, and how those individual parts of the body are shaped. 
And ultimately that's gonna help us narrow down the kind of bird that we're actually seeing in the field. And when we start looking within a group, so these two kinds of birds are within the same group of birds, the Anatidae family, which includes ducks, geese, and swans. Birds that are within the same group or in the same family tend to have similar characteristics to each other. They have shared characteristics, as you'll hear me call them uh, often throughout the presentation. And these shared characteristics are what we want to sort of hone in on and focus on as we're looking at these different groups of birds to say, okay, we see now that the Anatidae family with these ducks, geese, and swans have similar characteristics of having webbed feet, a thick sloping bill, uh, you know, a longer neck, a larger body relative to the size of the head. And when we can clue in on and key in on these particular features, that allows us to say, okay, this bird, even if I don't know what species it is, even if I can't necessarily get down to species level, I can hone in on and focus on the group of birds that it's in to help me from there to narrow down to a species level. So that's what we're gonna be really uh, getting into the nitty gritty I've been talking about more. So as I just mentioned, so bird groups that are related to each other tend to have similar shared characteristics. And when we start getting into uh, the how, how birds are related to each other, we um, wanna mention their taxonomy. And I'm not gonna get into it too much, but ultimately all the taxonomy is, is classifying organisms based on those shared characteristics. So when birds are closely related to each other taxonomically, they most likely have a similar size and shape, similar uh, parts of their body that look and, and um, are sized similarly to each other. So if we use the house sparrow as an example here, as we go through sort of this taxonomic order and, and where, where those fall uh, into play here, we can start with class at the very top. And the class is that larger classification that all birds are, are within. So if we're gonna look at mammals, for example, the class would be mammalia. It's a totally separate group of birds. So all birds fall within that class, aves. Then as we get more specific to try and figure out where exactly this house sparrow falls uh, uh, as it relates to other birds, we'll see that it's in the order Passeriformes, which I'm gonna talk about in more detail here in a minute. And even more specific, we can start narrowing down for this house sparrow specifically and see that it's in the family group, Passeridae, or the true sparrows or old world sparrows. Then genus, even more specifically, and finally species. So this species name is specific to the house sparrow, Passer domesticus, and uh, no other species has that, that same name unless of course there's other subspecies of, of particular birds, but we're not gonna get into that too much. So we're gonna go back up to order and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we can use this larger group classification to narrow down the kinds of birds that we're seeing in the field just based off of the order initially. So often what we like to do is we like to break down that order or groups of birds into two larger groups that helps us differentiate and separate birds that are slightly different from each other in some way. They're all birds, but there's characteristics about them that are different that allow us to start doing that narrowing down process. So first, passerines versus non-passerines. Those are the two groups that we're gonna, that we're gonna first um, break birds out into. Non-passerines are any bird not in the order Passeriformes. Now, if you remember, the house sparrow is in the order Passeriformes. So um, that'll, that'll kind of come into play here. So non-passerines are not any, are any bird not in the, this particular order, not in the order Passeriformes. Passerines, on the other hand, are birds that are in the order Passeriformes. And the reason that they are in that particular order is for two particular things. Uh, they have perching feet, which is a distinct two toes or three toes in front and one toe in back, just like you see on this house sparrow here, that allows them to easily grip on and perch onto tree branches, reeds, blades of grass, you name it. 
And that particular toe structure is unique to, uh, to passerines, but also passerines are what we consider songbirds. So they have a unique uh, vocal box, a syrinx that allows them to sing those sort of melodic songs that we often think of when we think of songbirds. Uh, so those are the two things that differentiate what a passerine is from a non-passerine. And when we look at these two images here, you'll notice that the mallard example on the left has non-perching feet. Uh, those webbed feet are distinct in that, you know, they have the webs going between all the different toes. There's a technically a fourth toe in the back that's more like a spur instead of a functional toe. And you, it, of course, mallards can perch or, or just stand on, you know, a boardwalk or a log or something like that. But they can't uh, grip and perch the same way that a passerine bird like this house sparrow might be able to. So other examples of these kinds of birds, of non-passerines, eagles, so birds of prey, kites, uh, uh, other kinds of raptors, hawks, vultures, they are all non-passerines. Although they have four toes that can grip onto things and we do see them kind of what looks like perching on branches, they have a very distinct uh, foot structure that uh, for their talents allow them to grip onto prey specifically. Um, it's a different structure and we're gonna get more into toe structure a little bit later. So you'll see what that looks like up close. Uh, but raptors not, are non-passerines. Mallards and their uh, other related birds like swans and geese and uh, other seabirds like puffins and um, guillemots, those anything with flipper or um, webbed feet, gulls, those are all non passerines. Ring neck pheasants, they have long toes for running across the ground. Also, uh, birds like roadrunners, for example, they have a distinct toe structure where they have three long toes in front and sort of a spur in back but they're not for perching. Those are not uh, passerines. They're not in the order passeriformes. And egrets, herons, bitterns, shorebirds, uh, other birds that like to hang out by the water and have a distinct toe structure for being adapted to uh, living on marshy areas or wet, wetland areas. Those are also not passerines. They're not in the order passeriformes. And in contrast, passerines, those birds with perching feet, have those little uh, toes, those three toes in front and the one in back to allow them to perch easily. Those include uh, birds like this, house sparrow, jays, uh, crows, warblers, um, finches, thrushes, all these kinds of birds are passerines. And I know that it's a lot to kind of look at those little details on the toe, but one thing to keep in mind is that uh, some of the largest passerines are actually in ravens. Uh, ravens are the largest kind of passerine that you would see and any other passerine bird is not going to be any bigger than that. So if you see a bird that's much larger than a raven, it's probably not a passerine. So how can this help you narrow down what you're actually seeing in the field? Well, Based on, based on what we've learned here when we're separating into two groups, this don't worry about, I know this is kind of a scary looking um, diagram, don't worry about sort of the specifics of it, but what this is showing is the different groups of birds and all uh, in, throughout the world. And all the birds that are in that yellow circled area are passerines. So that means that about half of the birds in the world are passerines and that uh, in, in your field guide, for example, half of those birds are going to be passerines. So in any given area where you are located, uh, any bird that you might be seeing on your bird list or in your field guide uh, or you know, in your backyard or in your local park, the potential birds that you could be seeing outside are cut in half where half of them are uh, passerines and half of them are not passerines approximately. So that allows us, if we can differentiate between these two groups in the field, we've already potentially cut in half the potential birds that we're seeing in the field. So if we can make that distinction between passerine and non-passerine, we know sort of what overall groups to look for uh, when we're looking at in the field. And so this is my field guide. It's the Sibley Guide to Birds of Western North America. I'm um, on the west coast of the U.S. In, in California right now. So this is the guide that I'm using. And you'll see that uh, this guide in particular is in taxonomic order. So if your field guide is also in taxonomic order where it's grouping birds uh, by similar uh, similarities, then you'll be able to use this technique. Um, 
the first half of your guide is always going to be the non-passerines, and then the second half of your guide is going to be the passerines. And in my guide here, you'll see that my finger is at the delineation between the passerines and the non-passerines. So that whole front half of the guide includes the non-passerines, the chicken-like birds, like the pheasants, the gulls, the shorebirds, the raptors, like eagles and owls. All of those kinds of birds are in the front half of the guide. Then in the second half of the guide, all the passerines, that's gonna include the thrushes, the finches, the jays and, and crows, the sparrows, all those other birds are gonna be in the second half of my guide. So if you're looking at a bird and you're thinking, okay, which part of my guide do I flip to when I'm trying to identify this particular bird? Uh, that's gonna be that first narrowing down process that you can use. And again, so some of the larger bodied birds mostly are gonna be in the front half of the guide with those non-passerines and the smaller bodied birds are gonna be in the second half of the guide with the passerines. And there are some exceptions to this. Um, woodpeckers and hummingbirds, for example, are uh, not uh, passerines, even though they, they might look similar to some of the passerines and they, um, are a little bit small and they're smaller in size. Those are not passerines, so they're going to be closer to the middle of your guide in that sense. And also, I want to mention too uh, that a lot of my experience with with birds and birding is in uh, North America and Europe. So uh, a lot of the references that I'm using are going to be to those particular birds, but this applies no matter no matter where you are. So now we're going to get a little bit more specific and we're going to continue that narrowing down process. So now we've been able to say, okay, I can differentiate between birds that are passerines and non-passerines based on their foot shape and, and their overall size in general, but how can we then narrow it down even more? And while you might be able to use this technique to sometimes get to a species level ID, even getting to this family level and figuring out the general group that a bird is in can be really helpful uh, in trying to figure out a bird's ID. So let's go into family a little bit deeper and see how we might be, be able to use this as a tool to help with our identification skills. So when we're looking at, so Passeri Day, the true sparrows, just as we uh, were talking about with the house sparrow, all birds within this family group have the shared characteristics of having a short, strong conical bill, as well as a thick neck and a broad chest. And the same thing goes with the um, Emberizidae uh, sparrows, uh, some of the other kinds of sparrows in general. Uh, most sparrows are gonna have that short, strong conical bill. Um, and that's a really interesting characteristic to look at. We're gonna get into uh, bill shape and size in a little bit more detail here in a bit. But uh, with this particular characteristic, you even if you see a small you know, brownish streaked bird, if you're looking at that bill shape and size, that can help you narrow down what family or overall group of birds that bird might be in. Um, so if we look at some of, the, some of the different birds that we might find in these groups, the house sparrow, the saxel sparrow, the great sparrow, you can see they all have these shared characteristics. And these birds are found in various parts of the world. They're not all found in the same place. So no matter where they are in the world, they're all in the same family group, they're all similarly related to each other, and they all have these shared characteristics of having a short, strong conical bill. Uh, and you can see if we didn't have those color distinctions and of course the location differences, geographic location differences, it'd be pretty, pretty hard to tell them apart necessarily. And they all have a really similar shape, not only their overall body shape, but the size and shape of the individual parts of the bird. So what about a non-passerine? If we look at the Ardidae family with herons, egrets, and bitterns, uh, we'll see that all birds within this family group, within this group of birds, have coiled or S-shaped necks and straight dagger-like bills, long, thick, straight dagger-like bills. Um, they also often have longer legs and longer toes because of the kinds of habitats that they live in around marshy areas or wetland areas. And I wanna point out too that you'll see with birds in the Ardidae family, they can range anywhere from 25 centimeters from the tip of their bill to the tip of their tail in length. 
250 centimeters from the tip of the bill to the tip of the tail. And I mentioned that because, you know, I, I said earlier that usually birds within the same kind of group are going to be sized similarly, but that's where then looking at the shape of the body and the individual parts of the body are really going to come in handy here. Because even if a bird's a little bit more compact, if it has these characteristics that are uh, distinguishable for this particular family group, then immediately you're able to sort of inform your decision about what kind of bird you might be looking at. So here are some birds that are in the Ardy Day family, the great egret, the tricolored heron, the yellow bittern. All of these birds you'll see, and some of their necks are kind of um, uh, coiled in on themselves, so it's a little bit hard to see how elongated they can be. Uh, it's a little bit easier in that tricolored heron there. But they all have a coiled or S-shaped neck, a longer neck with a long dagger-like bill and longer legs relative to their body size. Um, and I, I think that these examples are really great to use because they're so distinct. So these RD Day birds are very distinct from those sparrows that we were just looking at. And as we start looking at that bill shape and size alone, that can give us a lot of information about what kind of bird we might actually be looking at or, or seeing in the field. And that narrowing down process can be uh, really beneficial when you're just trying to even get down to that species level identification. And all of many of these different families are found all over the world. All these different groups of birds can be found everywhere. So if we use thrushes as an example, uh, we were just you know, talking about thrushes earlier too. So all thrushes, no matter where they're found in the world, have this shared characteristic of having a short blunt tip bill and they have relatively long legs compared to other, um, other songbirds or other, other passerine birds. And they have those perching feet and they have sort of a distinct broad chest. Um, and, you know, I have sort of a funny story about this too. My husband and I lived in Germany for a few years. And one of the first birds that we saw when, when we lived there was a blackbird, this bird in the upper right. And, you know, I knew, I knew just upon looking at him, like, okay, that doesn't look like it's in the blackbird family because the shape is totally different from, from what a blackbird looks like. Uh, but it looked and it moved so similar to the American robin that I knew and I grew up with. And upon looking in my field guide, I saw a sure thing looking in the thrush section, there it was, the blackbird. Um, but you know, if we didn't have those, those color distinctions amongst all these different kinds of, of birds, it would be kind of hard to tell them apart. Uh, they look and they're shaped so similarly. Uh, and the reason why this is you know, also really interesting is if there's a bird you've never seen before, or if you're going to a new location that you've never visited and you're seeing a new bird for the first time, uh, when you start looking at the overall shape and the, the outline and sort of the essence of what that bird looks like, uh, you can automatically say, okay, actually that looks really similar to a bird I already know. Maybe it's in the thrush family uh, because I know I can compare it to, to the birds that I already recognize, that I already know uh, around me. Um, so this, I, I just think it's really cool. You know, you can, that the size and shape is just something that sort of transcends these family groups and these groups of birds, no matter where they're located. So, and as I just mentioned, you know, you can use the characteristics that you're seeing in a bird and compare them to birds that you already know uh, and that you see often. So even if you don't know what a particular bird species is, if it looks uh, similar and it's shaped similarly and it has similar characteristics of its individual parts to birds that you already do know, start there. Uh, start there with your identification process. And as you're going through your field guide and uh, or even your app, um, you know, even if you go into, if you don't have your field guide with you, even if you go into your app, you say, oh, that looks like a thrush and you type thrush in there and you look at the different kinds of thrushes it might be, that at least is narrowing down the process for you to figure out what exactly you're looking at. So what I wanna do is I want to uh, go over some of the different parts of the bird, the size and shape of different parts of the bird that I think are beneficial to just take an extra look at. Even if there's a bird that you know really well, uh, take a moment to take a look at it and, and note what the, what the size and shape of the bill is. So as I'm going through these different bill shapes, uh, keep in mind what, uh, what, what those different shapes are. And as you're looking at birds out in the field, uh, you know, 
consider those different shapes at, when you're trying to identify, identify the bird or put it into a particular group of birds. So there's a uh, generalist bill shape. So uh, birds that like crows and ravens and grackles, they have really a uh, thick and pointed bill that they're able to use sort of as a tool uh, to use in different situations to eat lots of different kinds of foods. There's insect catching bills where they're really very tiny and short. Uh, but they're very slender, not, not as long as a hummingbird, but not as thick as, as some of the other birds like the, um, like the herons. You can see they're really tiny and, and thin and that's ideal like tweezers for being able to pluck insects out of the air or off of a tree branch or off of a leaf. There are grain eating bills. So those thick conical shaped kind of bills like we were talking about with the sparrows um, and grosbeaks beaks also have large thick bills like this. And that means that they are trying to break in through grains or seeds or, or different kinds of nuts like that. Uh, but they're a very thick conical shaped bill. And you can tell that they're differently shaped and, and thickness compared to that insect eating bill that we just saw where it's almost, it's more tweezer like as compared to this where it's more built towards being able to break open the outer shell of, of seeds. And some more unique shapes that, you know, we might not necessarily see on all birds, but can be really great if we're trying to get to a species level identification. Um, this uh, crossbills eat coniferous seeds. So they use their uniquely shaped bill, which is uh, the upper mandible and the lower mandible are crossed over each other, creating their crossed bill, hence their name, uh, to help them eat uh, uh, the cones, break, get the seeds out of the cones of conifers, of, of evergreen trees. So when you see a bird like this, if you know you only have one kind of cross bill in your area and you see that uniquely shaped bill, it immediately gives you the answer of what it's going to be. Um, and actually, I, I, um, I'll tell another little story. I was hiking um, just a couple of weeks ago down in Yosemite here in California, and uh, we came across this large bird, much larger, it was kind of like a very large finch. And it had reddish collar on its head and on, on its breast and on its back, and then sort of a grayish brown on its wings and its lower half. And, you know, initially we were thinking, oh my gosh, that kind of looks like a crossbill just based on its colors. But when you put your binoculars right up to those mandibles, to the, to the bill, we didn't see a crossbill. And uh, upon looking at other kinds of birds that looked like this bird, we found it was actually a pine gross beak, but it was that crossed bill that initially we were trying to look for because we were saying, okay, if this is a cross bill, that's gonna be our clue. Uh, there's, only one, there's only one kind that we could find here. And if we see those distinct shaped mandibles crossing over each other, we have our answer there. Uh, so this can really be a very beneficial clue when you're trying to hone in on what bird you're actually seeing. There are scything birds. So uh, avocets in particular uh, have this very beautiful, uniquely shaped, thin upturned bill that help them uh, sweep their bill across the water to uh, eat insects uh, from, from the surface of the water. And again, if you see a bird with a, uh, with a up upturned thin bill like this, uh, it's such a unique shape uh, to pay attention to that you know, you're easily going to be able to narrow down what kind of bird you're potentially seeing. Fruit eating birds, and uh, you know, I included a range of bill shapes and sizes in this one because there are a lot of different birds that eat fruit. Um, and, you know, but overall they're sort of of a similar shape, even though their sizes are drastically different between the tanager and the toucan. But overall, uh, when we're looking at uh, sort of that general shape, we're not looking at something that is going to be drilling into wood or going to be scything across the top of water. Um, we're looking at this sort of overall shape here. And speaking of uh, drilling into wood, so chiseling birds, so woodpeckers, sap suckers, this picklet here, um, they uh, have that very strong, thick, long bill designed for uh, drilling into wood and extracting insects. So uh, when we're looking at the bill shape, 
we can see this almost actually looks in shape. It looks really similar to what you might see when you're looking at um, like, you know, the heron only it's very, very small. So when you're looking at these kinds of uh, shapes and sizes on the different birds, of course, those all come into play, but that very long, strong bill, that's different from that uh, um, little tweezer-like bill that we saw on the warbler earlier, for example, the little insect catching ones. Dip netting birds, uh, birds that have a unique structure to their bill so that they can scoop up fish, especially during flight. Um, so pelicans are really well known for having this particular feature and that allows us to also narrow down what we're seeing that way. Surface skimming birds, so skimmers are these uh, really beautiful birds that have this super unique bill structure where their lower mandible, the lower part of their bill is longer than the top part of their bill and it helps them uh, skim the uh, water for fish as they're foraging. But again, if you see this kind of bill structure, this is super unique and allows you to immediately start being able to narrow down the kind of bird that you're seeing. Nectar feeding birds uh, usually have a very long, thin needle-like bill. It can be straight or it can be slightly curved, uh, but this is often an indication of, you know, very specific groups of birds that hone in on their primary food sources being nectar. Raptorial birds, so uh, eagles and kites and um, uh, hawks, uh, buzzards, they all have uh, this thick, strong bill with a very sharp hook on the end, distinct for catching and, and capturing onto prey. Filter feeding birds have a, uh, a flat bill or a portion of their bill is flat in some way so that they can um, filter through the water and sweep their, their bill through the water to uh, catch small uh, invertebrates usually. So for the spoon bill, it has that flat uh, end to its bill, that spoon. And then for, for flamingos, they have a flat uh, front end to their bill so they can stick their bill down into the ground and they kind of shuffle their feet into the water to, to kick things up in the water as they're filtering um, their food through their bill that way. And again, these are very distinctly shaped, uh, shaped bills. There's that heron like we were talking about earlier with the really uh, distinctly thick, strong uh, dagger-like bill. And uh, you know they're really well known for being able to just quickly uh, dart out and catch frogs and shellfish. But for herons, bitterns, egrets, uh, they all have this same bill, or bill structure as we talked about earlier. Also kingfishers, they'll hang out on the top of branches or in trees and they'll dive down from above uh, with that really uh, dagger-like bill to capture prey that way. Probing. Uh, um, bills are typically very long and sometimes they can be completely straight, sometimes they can be a little bit curved, but they stick them in and out of sand or mud to catch crabs and, and worms and, and other invertebrates like um, as well. And this is mostly reserved for, for shore, shorebirds. Uh, these long, um, you know, they're not particularly strong looking, but they're, they look like they're more for probing. Pursuit fishers. So this very distinct bill shape is uh, really unique to cormorants and morgansers um, and frigate birds as well also have this kind of bill shape and they they have this long shape with a sort of tooth at the end or a hooked, uh, hooked part at the end. And uh, one thing that I think is interesting to note too with mergansers, they are actually diving ducks. So they're in the same family as the uh, Anatidae family with ducks and swans and, and geese, but they have a slightly differently shaped bill. So if you're seeing a bird in the water that looks like it has this sort of duck shape to it, but you notice that really unique uh, bill shape where it has that hook on the end, it's a little bit longer instead of the like gently sloping bill, then that's going to help you be able to narrow down what kind of bird is hanging out in the water there. And scavenging birds, so uh, vultures and condors have a unique bill shape specific for uh, tearing into flesh. And it looks a little bit similar to uh, the other pursuit fisher kind of uh, bill, only you'll notice that it's a lot 
thicker and also uh, of course the kinds of birds that you're going to find um, these bills on is uh, distinct to condors and vultures but ultimately you'll notice with this bill shape uh, if you're comparing the scavenging bill shape to the raptorial one uh, that the shape of this bill is distinctly different so if you're looking at a vulture and you're not sure oh maybe that's a maybe that's an eagle or maybe that's a buzzard or hawk or something like that but you notice that bill shape that'll help clue you into uh, maybe it's actually a vulture or a condor so ultimately mo for the most part uh, birds that have uh, the same sort of group birds that are within the same family group or that are similarly related to each other are going to have the same shared characteristic of having a similarly shaped bill so as we mentioned those sparrows having the short thick conical bill um, and the herons egrets and bitterns having a long strong uh, dagger-like bill all those birds are you're going to be able to help narrow down what you're actually seeing just based on that bill characteristic so keep that in mind the next time you're in the field take a look at the size and shape of the bill of the birds that you're looking at and uh, notice whether or not is it a, a thin needle-like or tweezer-like bill is it you know thicker and conical shaped um, and, and kind of start putting those pieces together when you're looking at birds that even birds that you know well to say, okay, so it's in this, this bird is in this family group. It has this shape of its overall body. It has the shape of its individual parts so that you know when you see another bird that maybe you don't know that has those same characteristics, it can help inform you about uh, potentially what family group it's in. So let's just talk a little bit about the toes too, and keep in mind that uh, those perching toes we mentioned earlier are uh, really specific for passerine birds uh, for the most part. So they have those, as I mentioned earlier, the three toes in front and the one in back for gripping and perching. Um, and we see them doing that here and they, they're easily able to wrap their toes around uh, something to, to perch easily on, whether that's a reed or a branch or a blade of grass. There are webbed feet uh, for gulls and geese and ducks and swans to help them swim and paddle. Um, and so they have this distinct uh, foot shape for that. Wading birds, and I liked, I always like to put coots down on here because coots have really funny feet. They have those fun lobed feet that they use um, for walking around in the habitats they like to be in around waterways and, and marshes. Um, but other than these sort of lobed feet, there's also uh, these long elongated toes, really long toes to allow them to navigate uh, different kinds of waterways. Walking toes, a lot of times quails, partridges, ptarmigans, other chicken-like birds are going to have uh, sort of more walking toes. They have three uh, toes in front that are kind of small relative to their body size and a little spur toe in the back. There are those talons that uh, I was talking about earlier. So although they have those four toes and three of them kind of look like they're facing forward, they're more evenly spaced than a passerine bird's uh, toes are typically. And uh, they have those really distinct talons on their, on their feet, on their toes. And climbing toes. And this one I wanted to uh, focus on especially too, because these toes are two toes in front and uh, two toes in back, the zygodactyl is what it's called. Um, and so this is specific for birds that tend to climb up trees or other kinds of substrate. So cuckoos and woodpeckers are really, and sapsuckers are really well known for having these zygodactyl feet. Uh, and I wanted to point that out because although these birds might look like, you know, they look like they might be perching, they look like they're small enough or that they have sort of the same structure that some of the other passerine birds do, but they're not in that passerine uh, order, that passerine overall group. Uh, they have a different shaped feet and they have these uh, special climbing feet. So if you're looking in your field guide, for example, and you're, you're looking at a cuckoo or a woodpecker outside, uh, you're going to probably find them closer to the middle of your guide, um, of your field guide, or in the, in the section where your non-passerines are going to be. 
Then there's some other features that we can look at as far as shape goes. So crests. I love crested birds because I think they have so much personality. Uh, and the hoopoe is one of my favorites. But you know, there's other birds like jays that, that have crests on them and um, cranes that have crests on them and, and different kinds of plumes. And those make for really unique features just to uh, keep in mind and to look out for when we're trying to make a species level identification. Leg length, I think, is also important to mention here. Uh, typically, birds that have longer legs uh, tend to uh, prefer marshlands or grasslands or other areas where they need their body lifted up away from the ground a little bit more. So their legs are relatively long relative, uh, compared to the size of their, of their body. So look at the, the leg length also as you're comparing what, uh, what bird you might be looking at in the field. And tails. Uh, different kinds of birds have differently shaped tails, and especially when they have fun uh, plumage like this mot mot has, it can be it can be really helpful for trying to distinguish what kind of bird you might be seeing based on that that shape. And uh, with mot mots, it's really fun because they have those distinct uh, long uh, sort of artery that goes down into those little tiny uh, tufts of feathers down at the bottom there. Uh, it's a very mot mot thing. So uh, when you see something like that in the field, uh, it can be a lot easier to try and distinguish what you're seeing based on that. So I have a few tips for you uh, just to uh, work on implementing these things when you're out in the field and just to reiterate some of these concepts a little bit more so that you can be practicing with it uh, and, and really kind of get comfortable with the idea of when you're looking at a bird, you're recognizing the kind of shape that it is and other birds that might be related to it or in a similar group or, or family. So I always like to keep a, a pocket notebook or a recording app on me and either draw out what I'm seeing or just take notes on what I'm seeing to reference with my field guide later. Um, and I think that this is this can be sort of a fun thing to do, as well as can be really useful just for um, your own reference as you're, you're going through. And it doesn't have to be in a notebook. I know some people you know, don't really enjoy notebooks necessarily. Uh, you can always write in your actual field guide or take little sticky notes and, and put notes in your field guide about, you know, the different features that are characteristic of birds within groups uh, in your field guide as well. I also always like to recommend downloading your local bird species checklist to get a good idea about the kinds of birds that you have in your area and getting familiar with those different family groups or groups of birds and, and sort of practicing on them. Um, Take, take some time to say, okay, what kind, what groups of birds do I have in my area? What species within those groups of birds are in my area? And how are they all, how do they all look similar to each other? Uh, how are they all related? What sorts of shared characteristics do they have? And you can do, you can get a bird species checklist by going to ebird.org, uh, their hotspot map, uh, by uh, contacting your local ornithological society or birding club or bird life international. Um, they typically have more localized uh, bird checklists. And if you're, if you're interested in the, the eBird, um, uh, location where you can get your checklist that way. Uh, you can go to eber.org forward slash hotspots. There are some areas that haven't been filled in um, for, for eBird just yet, but slowly filling in. And all this is is a map of locations where birders like you and me have submitted checklists of the birds that they've seen in, in all these different locations. And basically you can just go to the individual uh, locations on a map uh, to you know, enter your, your zip code or your address and, and, and find a nearby location with different birds that are listed. And it'll give you a checklist of the birds that other people have seen there, uh, which is a good place to start, I think. Um, and and in the email that I, uh, we're going to send also after this, I'll have sort of a how to of how you can utilize this tool and, and other ways to download your, your bird species checklist. And as you're looking at it for a checklist too, uh, here are some things that I think are helpful to have included in a, in a checklist. Uh, so having the birds in taxonomic order can be beneficial because then you can at least see. So for example, here, I can see all the pigeons and doves that are in my area. This is a wildlife area that's just a couple of miles up the road from where I am now. Um, so I can see all the pigeons and doves that are in my area. I can see the different kinds of hummingbirds that are in my area. So this is a comprehensive list of all the birds that are seen in that one location uh, nearby where I live. Uh, so having them in that family group, that taxonomic order uh, group can be really uh, useful in that way. 
The location should also be noted on the checklist. So the extent that's covered in that checklist, does it cover where you live? Um, is it 20 miles away? Is it you know, 100 miles away? Uh, how big is that extent that this list is covering? It should say on the checklist. Um, the date the checklist was last updated, are there new birds that people have seen in the area? And is, it, is, that, is that list slowly being added to? And the total number of species listed in that area too can be really helpful. I also think that it's really fun when there's a little spot next to the bird where you can actually make a little check mark or make notes or something like that if you do see the bird in the field. And uh, finally, I think that uh, one thing that I love to do and, and that I love to recommend is as you're going through either your bird species checklist or your field guide, note which birds you're looking at in the field or, or seeing in your field guide or that are in your local area that are named for their size and shape. Uh, and I say this because it helps us to make that connection of what we're actually seeing versus what the, what the bird identification is. So the shoebill is a really beautiful example of this. It's such a unique bird and its bill shape is, is so unique as well. And it's named for its bill shape. Uh, so I love being able to make those kinds of connections. And as you're looking at birds, if you notice that it's named for its size and shape or a size, the size and shape of one of its parts, or even if it's named for its, the other keys to bird identification, its color, its habitat where it's found, uh, any kinds of distinguishing behaviors that uh, they, they usually make. Those are all things to keep in mind as you're going through and you're, you're working on your identification skills to uh, note which birds are named for those characteristics because it just helps uh, those connections in our mind a little bit better. Remember, okay, when you see that bird, you see that unique feature and you immediately know what, um, what kind of bird you're looking at. Okay, so uh, that is all I wanted to cover today as far as the size and shape of, of birds goes. I know that was a lot of material uh, to cover in the last hour, but uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And also, um, if you want to catch up with me later, if you want to talk about any bird stuff, whether it's this or any other related bird things, you can always reach out to me either on my email here at hello at birdingtools.com uh, or on social media at Facebook or Instagram at Birding Tools. Um, I have some resources on my website as well for general bird identification information. And uh, if, if you are a beginner or enthusiastic bird, who wants to learn more about some uh, other birding techniques and tips. Um, I also have a podcast called the Birding Tools Podcast, as I mentioned earlier, which you can listen to wherever you listen to podcasts or at my website. So thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Krista, for that wonderful and a very informative yeah. presentation. Of course. Um, yeah. I you was, want me to stop was... sharing screen? Yeah, sure, you can. Um, okay. It's up to you. Um, or do you want me to leave this up? I don't know. You can leave it up. I'm seeing someone, Joseph is asking in the chat if you can um, put your contact info in the in the mm. chat, please, because someone yep. uh, can't see the presentation. Of course. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, at first I was like, oh, we're only going to do one of the five, but then it's it's such an in-depth, um, you know, analysis. And I really love that you did, um, you know, you, you concentrated on the silhouettes. Um, because many of us tend to get thrown off by color and we just get this is like a vortex of color and we're always just thinking about okay well it's a red one this is a brown one then we get a bunch of brown birds that really look alike but if you look at yeah. their structure first or the silhouette then it will make identification a, a ton easier Absolutely. I'm seeing, yeah i'm seeing one uh, raised hand in the chat Ro, would you like to ask a question yeah hello thank you hi Ro. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, how difficult is it to um, identify a species of dogs since they move around a lot? <clears throat> and I'm <clears throat> sorry, I'm asking specifically because there's this one, literally one individual, a duck in near my house in, in this big water place. Yeah. And just, I, can, I cannot find its ID. Hmm. So it's like, I don't know where, how to identify it. Sure. Um, so with ducks, ducks are always kind of challenging. And I, I think they're a lot of fun because they, uh, they're 
are so many different kinds of them. So uh, first, one of the suggestions that I would that I would make. Um, so there's two different groups of ducks um, as far as narrowing down goes. Um, and then and then I'll get into like other tools maybe to, to try and to try and identify it. Uh, so there's two different kinds of ducks. There's dabbling ducks and there's diving ducks. Um, and diving ducks are actually going to dive down into the ground, uh, into the water. Um, and usually their tail kind of sits below the water. And dabbling ducks are going to have their tail above the water. And then they kind of just tip their head forward with their butt kind of up in the air when they're eating. Um, so if it's a duck that does one of those two kinds of things, then that can at least help you narrow down what group it's in, what group of ducks it's in. Um, Cause as we start narrowing down within, within family groups, that's when it kind of gets a little bit more complicated. But um, if, if you're looking at your field guide and you see it, it's, it should be sort of distinguished between dabbling ducks and diving ducks. See if it's, if it's diving or if it's sort of tilting its head down into the ground or into the water uh, first. Okay. Um, um, sorry. Do I have to answer? No. <laughs> no. If if you don't know, that's totally fine. Um, you can you can observe it uh, the next time you're able to see it. Um, but that'll at least tell you sort of overall what group of ducks it might be in. And then um, from there, you know, with ducks, it can, be, it can be kind of hard because they hybridize or they can different species of ducks can mate with each other. Uh, and what happens when, when that happens is their coloration can get a little wonky. Um, you might like, you might see a bird and you might think, oh, well, it's got the coloration of this species and this species and this species. It might be a hybridized bird. Uh, it might be a bird that's two different species have made it together. Um, so uh, with, with that, um, when you start looking, that's where the color component kind of starts coming in, looking at where the color is distributed on the body, um, what color the bill is, what color the feet are, um, and, and if there's distinguishing marks on the wing. Um, and if you're able to get a picture of it, feel free to do that and you can for sure send it to me. Um, we can post it up on my social media page. We can get a hive mind going and we can try to figure out what the heck that duck is. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. So I do have a picture. I'm gonna send it to you because it's a- Great, very yeah, for sure. Feel free to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just have one more question. Um, so, well, I don't, I'm a biologist, but I don't know much about ducks. <laughs> and so I noticed that these, uh, in these water plays, I'm telling you, there's like a colony of uh, tons of these same species of ducks. Mm -hmm. And then there's this just one weird duck that I'm telling you that is much bigger and different. And I was just wondering, like, is that natural? Or do you think it's like, some person that had a duck just went there and leave it there it, or it they could have been yeah it, it totally could have been um it's hard to say to be honest with you um it's not uncommon for you to get you know vagrant or rare species that sometimes just they see a body of water they see other ducks and they're like oh hey friends and they they go down and they want to hang out with with those similar kinds of birds on optimal habitat or they got separated but um it, it's very possible. I've totally seen it here where I see these really strange geese or whatever ducks um, that are not native here um, that are hanging out. And it's probably somebody had them as a pet or uh, uh, they were breeding them or something and one of them got loose. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Yeah, um, I'm, seeing, um, I'm seeing a lot of thank yous in the chat. Oh yeah, of course. Thank you everyone for being here. I really appreciate you. Yeah. Um, Susie is saying Muscovy ducks have caught me out before because they have a variety of plumages and mix with mallards. Yeah. I've, mm, I've experienced yeah. that as well also. Yeah, that's, oh my gosh, that's the thing. Um, that's the thing with ducks, you know, and actually somebody sent me a picture of a duck a few weeks ago and it did look like a funny kind of duck, but it has this uh, mallards in particular uh, have a little curly black curly Q feather on their rump on the top of their tail. Um, I don't know. I don't know if the picture that I had in here had that little curly Q, but sometimes if, if a duck doesn't look like the right color, but has that little curly Q, you'll know that it's a, a duck that's probably hybridized with a mallard. Um, <laughs> let me see, actually, oops. 
just close the chat. Um, let's see if I can go back to that picture of a mallard just so I can show you what that little curly cue looks like on its bottom. Oh, it's kind of hard to see there. Um, yeah, so right here, they're gonna have like a little, little curl on their tail. <laughs> Just for anyone who's seeing a, a funny looking duck too, and um, it could be mixed with something else, probably also it could be a mallard. Interesting, interesting. Uh, I saw Shailish, you, did you have your hand raised to ask a question? Oh yeah, thank you very much. Hi. Uh, wonderful. Hi, how are you? I'm great, thank you. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Um, I was looking at well trying to of listening to your presentation you know you mentioned dabbling ducks you know where mm -hmm. they die but they just put their head just below the water line yeah the northern northern pintail do that i've seen them so it's just yes. a bit of the neck is underwater but you can see half of your body kind of and i've, I've taken photographs of it when it, i've seen both male and female doing at the same time um some of the ducks like the eurasian Shovelers, when they're feeding, they kind of go in circles. Mm -hmm. I don't know why someone told me because when they're feeding, they're doing lots of disturbance, you know, with the mud and all that. Yeah, for so different ducks have different feeding behavior. Most of the ducks are either diving ducks, some do not dive. I've noticed right. the other thing, uh, especially depending on what part of the continent you are budding in. Now, if you're budding in Asia or Africa, mm -hmm. you get the open bill stock. Now, if you look at the bill structure, it's completely different because they're feeding on wetland and their main food is a snail. So they, they use that kind of a tool which they have to crack open to remove the snail from the shell. Yeah. But when you look at that bill, it's totally different. I think, what? Why is it got that kind of a gap? You've got a gap in between, but that's one of the tools, uh, yes. feeding behavior. Um, then you presented this photo of, uh, I think maybe a black vulture and, uh, and uh, uh, one of condor. the other species. Yeah. With the vultures, if you look at their face, it's always bare. There's no yeah. feathers because mm -hmm. you know when they're feeding and because they're putting the head in a carcass, they don't want any, you know, when you put in a flesh, in a caca which has just been killed a yes. lot of blood is going to stick on your feather on your face right but they don't have feathers because you know if you if it get infected it'd be a big problem so yeah. those are the two things you have to look at you look at the bill and look at the face at the same time that's what yes. i look at and no that's those are really great observations yeah and that's a good point about the vultures and the condors mm -hmm. they do have that naked head to yeah, avoid head. Yeah, avoid getting keep blood. away. You know they don't want any. I mean, okay, even though they get the blood, but it's, it doesn't infect or infect feathers. Mm -hmm. A lot of birds do have a different feeding behavior. Uh, me being a bird watcher, uh, I do a lot of counts. So when I'm counting birds, especially when I'm counting preference and non preference, I have to be careful what I'm counting. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get mixed up, you know, with crisscross names and you know. Other thing you do get with ducks are uh, either hybrid or what you call eclipse. So you will mm -hmm. see a mallard male and think what kind of color is that? It's got a bit of you know mixed color, but what you call them eclipse. So they're not fully male color yet. But they've got a bit of a some plumage color and think what what is going on here? So you get all these hybrids. I get a lot of hybrid with ducks and geese. Yeah. Canada geese will breed with some other geese and you're thinking, how do I, you know, it's just a mind boggling, <laughs> but thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Thank you for those insights too. I really appreciate you adding that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's something also I, I um, found out and I'm looking at the chat as well and something about silhouettes in terms of vultures as Sharish was talking about vultures, it's that we see them a lot um, soaring a lot of the times, and it's a very good um, 
I think I'm not sure if your audio has stopped. Krista? Oh, can oh, you can you? Yeah, I'm hearing you now. Good. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, and that's that's a really good point, Susie, too, that I didn't mention in this presentation is a silhouette of flying birds and how they look different as they're flying. Um, and that kind of ties into some of that behavioral aspect too. Um, if even if you're only seeing the silhouette and you're kind of seeing their movement. Um, but for vultures, for example, they uh, they have a what's called a dihedral um, silhouette. So instead of sort of flying it straight uh, or their shape as they're soaring and the sky is not straight across like this, it's sort of just canted in a V shape just slightly, um, which can sometimes be hard depending on the angle that you're looking at the bird. But if they're silhouetted, uh, there's sometimes some, some things that you can still keep an eye out for. Um, and in your field guide, not all field guides have this. So sometimes having an app handy can be beneficial too, where they have um, uh, pictures of the bird in flight. So you can see what the feathers look like. And uh, if, if the feathers on the primaries and the secondaries on the wing as they're outstretched for a vulture versus a hawk or, or a buzzard or an eagle can uh, be differentiated because those shapes are, are, are different amongst those different groups of birds too. Susie's also asking, uh, is there a key way to tell the difference between eagles and vultures soaring? Um, that's a good question. Um, I guess, you know, for me, it might, it might depend more on, uh, the location and what kind of species you're looking at. But for me, that might be more, uh, the behavioral aspect and how they're flying. So the way that vultures um, soar and end up getting into those um, thermals is typically more common than eagles. Uh, eagles will soar like that, but a lot of times they're more uh, direct flyers flying from point A to point B. Um, so that might be one thing to keep in mind for it. And I think depending on the species that you're looking at, looking at sort of the, the primary fingers on the bird, on the, on the wings to see how distinct they are. Because for vultures, I find that uh, the, the fingers almost look more like gloves, like when, when your person has a glove on their hand compared to eagles and, and uh, hawks or, or buzzards or kites, the, the fingers don't seem to be as lobed or as distinct on the wing. Um, but that's just something that I've picked up. Um, I might have to like test that in the field a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. Observations tend to, like uh, personal observations for that matter, tend to teach you a whole lot more than, you know, whatever a field guide can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think for, for birds of prey, it can get a little bit tricky, but uh, for me personally, the key, the, the key apart from silhouettes, uh, the, the patterns on the wing and the tail. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them would have banding and, and maybe a little bit of striation or whatever on the feathers, but it depends on a good view. Sometimes, you know, you're looking at something a hundred, uh, you know, a couple of hundred meters up in the sky. So it can get a little bit difficult. And, some, and for me, I think that a lot of times when birds, birds, I am convinced that birds realize when I'm trying to figure them out. So they fly directly between me and the sun. So uh, I get blinded um, by the Yeah. Birds. Yeah. So. <laughs> Oops, sorry. I just had someone in the. I just un. I just muted you by mistake. Yeah. That's okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Someone came back in the in the waiting room, and I was trying to admit them, and uh, yeah, doing multiple things at once. Classic. Um. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking. I'm seeing some um, an invitation for you to do uh, identification on wobblers and cisticulars. Um, that's going to be a challenge, I'm sure. Oh, sorry, was that, I missed it. What yeah, was... That, was, that was a comment from Joseph. And, okay. Uh, yeah, just um, a challenge for you to do a, a, an identification presentation on wobblers and cisticulars. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh my gosh. So Warbler ID definitely is, um, is exciting. Um, and 
I don't know, I could always come back and do a presentation on that for sure. And that's, that's definitely, you know, since a lot of warblers look so similar, that's where it really comes into like the mm -hmm. color and pattern part of things and distribution, habitat distribution. Um, so I've got a ton of, I've got a ton of information about the five keys to bird identification in general on my podcast and, and on my website too. So if people are interested in sort of that like more holistic look at some of those other components, I know I only focused on the one today, but yeah, that's a great suggestion, Joseph. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, it's, I'm, I'm hoping and I'm sure everyone else is also hoping that we'll have you back at some point in some form to talk a little bit more about bird identification. For sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Yeah, so I'm th I think that I have sorted out all of the, the questions. I, if I miss anyone, I'm really, really sorry. Um, we were talking about um, birds that have uh, extra, extra like uh, keratin or elongated beaks. So I, I, shared, I took the liberty of sharing an article in the chat on avian keratin disorder. I think when you were talking about crossbills. So that's a viral infection, and I've actually also seen it here in Trinidad. Mm. So that's something we have to be mindful of for in terms of uh, bird feeders and stuff like that. Because mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, it's something that can spread from bird to bird, especially in, um, in a feeder, artificial feeder situation. Yeah, we, we just dealt with um, this issue here in California. Um, just a few months ago, everyone was asked to take their feeders down and bleach them and clean them and everything because pine siskins tend to uh, spread spread disease most readily at the at the feeders here. So, yeah, interesting. Yeah. All righty. Well, I think I think we can call it a call it a day or a night, depending on where you're from. Um, <laughs> I think it's it's probably uh, still morning where you are, Krista. It is. Yeah, I actually have to go out in the field after this. So got to go chase those grackles. <laughs> yeah, nice. Sounds fun. Sounds fun. So thank you on behalf of the team at Linda Boots and on behalf of everyone who's come here from all over the world. Uh, thank you so much. Huge appreciation. And this is a wonderful presentation. And um, yeah, look out for look out for this on YouTube at some point. I should um, I should get on that as soon as possible. So yeah. Um, take care, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Faraz, and everyone for, for having me and Learn the Birds. I really appreciate it, um, and it was nice to see you today. Thanks for coming. Hi, Susie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Learn the Birds, where all friends can meet, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, good to see you with smiling faces. All righty. Well, take care, everyone, and I'll catch you on the other side. Sounds good. Thanks so All much, right. everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.